Courtney, you're muted. Pardon me. Good evening, everyone. My name is Courtney Coffey, and I am the president of the Xi Zeta Omega chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated and chairman of the board of directors for the Ivy Foundation, our event sponsor tonight. Thank you for joining us in observation of Alpha Kappa Alpha's Pink Goes Red for Heart Health Community Impact Day. Black adults in the District of Columbia experience the highest rates of heart disease and are three times more likely to die from the disease than whites. This st statistic is even more concerning while we continue to navigate the COVID-19 pandemic. I'd like to thank our guest speaker that will be joining us here tonight, Dr. Joffrey Mount Barner, our event chair, Crystal Williams, our target two health and wellness chair, Leslie Goffney, and the entire Pink Goes Red planning committee for this important discussion. It is my hope that this event brings clarity and trusted information to you and the greater DC community so that we can live happy and healthy lives. Take care and be well. And without further ado, I'd happy to transition the rest of this program to Tracy Harrison, our first vice president and program chairman. Sora Tracy, good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Sora's family, neighbors, friends, and guests. It is my pleasure to introduce our physician panelist for this evening, Dr. Joffrey Mount Varner. Dr. Joffrey, as we affectionately call him, is an emergency room physician and split second decision expert. He has more than 25 years of making split second decisions that were truly life and death. He has received his formal training from Hampton University, Harvard University, Wayne State, George Washington, and Johns Hopkins. Dr. Joffrey was on the front lines of Hurricane Katrina while deployed with the Maryland National Guard as a physician. He was in charge of the emergency response to the Ebola crisis in 2014, served as a level one trauma chair, and has been on the front lines of the COVID pandemic. So without further, <clears throat> excuse me, without further ado, please join me in welcoming my fellow Hamptonian, my brother of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, and our neighbor as a lifetime resident of PG County, Dr. Joffrey Mount Varner, as he comes to discuss COVID, the vaccine, and the impact on African Americans with heart disease. Dr. Joffrey, welcome. Tracy, thank you very much. And thank you for that wonderful intro. Uh, thank you, President Courtney Coffey. Thank you, uh, members of the Xi Zeta Omega chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha. I am Howard University, and I'm honored to be on your program. And let me say that today um, we're going to move fast, um, but we're going to move fast at such a, a pace that if you pay attention, we will be just fine. As you already heard, I'm a crisis and split second decisions expert, which means that I go around the world. I teach executives, corporations, how to manage crisis. And as a result of COVID, um, I, I talk to about two to four million people uh, a week as it relates to like, COVID. But today we're about to learn a whole lot. Um, so I, I, I would encourage everyone to, to, to sit up, um, get ready to roll. And don't worry, there, there is a question and answer period in the, in the end. Let's define heart disease really quickly. I'm, and, and, I'm, and I'm being broad on purpose. Heart disease, well, first of all, it's the leading cause of death. It's the leading cause of death of black women. Heart disease is any disease that affects the heart. A uh, good example would be, how many people out there, put a one in the chat if you think you have heart disease. Put a one in the chat. Okay, all right, all right. Do you have high blood pressure? Because if you have high blood pressure, you should have put a one in the chat. High blood pressure is heart disease. Stroke is a sign of heart disease. Any type of clogged vessels is a sign of heart disease. And most kidney problems are caused by heart disease. In fact, they say, listen to this, listen to this. One out of every two black women 
over the age of 20 have some form of known or undiagnosed heart disease. One in out of two. I don't say that to scare you any type of way. I say that to inform you because information is key. There are risk factors for heart disease. We'll leave genetics off of the table because you can't do anything about your genes. The risk factors are obesity. Obesity is a risk factor. Hypertension, um, that's genetic in origin, and too much cholesterol. Don't, go, don't, don't worry. Hang with me because we're going to start to move soon. We're going we're gonna to start to move soon. And what we really need to understand, and this is key for some of us older people, I mean, for some of the older people and for those of us with parents. Now, listen to me. Lean in on this one. When it comes to black women and heart attacks, black women and heart attacks, they present differently than white men. They present differently. Meaning, the reason, so, so, so like, let me set it up. Um, if you have a heart attack, it's very important for you to, to, to have to notice the signs and symptoms right away so you can come to the ER, so an ER doctor like me, so we can give you the right mess and maybe get you to the cardiac cath lab. But the most important part of that is recognizing it. I know we're all taught chest pain and chest pain rating to the left arm or chest pain rating to the right. That is still a sign, but the most common sign of a heart disease of someone who may be having a heart attack is what? They feel extremely tired. They feel fatigued. I know that's non-specific, but in a study of 18,000 uh, um, um, people, black women, their most common signs, they, they feel very fatigued. The second most one is they had problems sleeping leading up to their heart event. And so normally you get eight hours sleep and all of a sudden you're like, wait a minute, I'm waking up just every hour. I'm not saying that's what you have, but it's a data point that you should be aware of. So don't always look just for the chest pain. Black women don't present. I'm not saying that they, they, they like don't. That's not the number one sign. It's still a sign. So, so if you have it, please take it seriously. Oh, and by the way, I forgot to tell you, forgive me. Nothing I say should be taken as medical advice. This is just for information purposes only. Now, now, what do you what can you do to lower your risk of heart disease? Well, the most common risk factor this day and age outside of genetics is obesity. You control the obesity. You control the hypertension. You control the heart problems. You control the cholesterol issues. So eating large fruits, eating, eating fruits and, and vegetables normally. You hear all that. I get it. Low sodium, low fat diet. Now, here's the one that people have difficulty with working out at least 30 minutes, five times a day. Now, people get confused by this workout. They think, I got to go to the gym. I got to lift weights. I got to run this. For no. At a minimum, a nice brisk walk, 30 minutes a day. I get it. It's cold. Guess what? You can walk around your house for 30 minutes a day. 30 minutes a day, five days a week, at least decreases your risk of developing heart disease by almost 50% depending on what age you are now. I know it seems small, but it's humongous. And just so you know, just, just, just so you know, people with heart disease, if they get COVID, they, have a, they, they, they tend to have worse outcomes. People with heart disease, if they contract COVID, they tend to have worse outcomes. I'm going to say it again. People with heart disease, if they get COVID, they tend to have worse outcomes. Now, let's just talk about COVID real quick. I get it. The vaccines are, are like, and everyone wants to like chill. Now, look, right now, I'm going to make you super users. Super users mean that what I'm about to tell you is factual. Take it in and make sure you go share it with your communities. Hey, do me a favor. Put a number eight in the chat if you can hear me. Put a number eight if you're following me. All right, wait, wait. I need more eights. I need more eights. I need, I, I, come on now. I need more eights. Yeah, I, I, and the Sisters of AKA think it's 8 because 1908. <laughs> yes. All right, here we go. Listen to this. We're going to get to the vaccines just as I real quick because I know that you all have um, questions. But look, while the vaccine is here, the models show by April 1st, the vaccines will only save about 6,000 lives. Whereas putting a mask on and socially distancing 
that will save up to 94,000 lives by April 1st. What's my point? The mask and the social distancing are absolutely key, especially the mask. Because here's what, follow me on this one. There are five places that are accountable for 80% of the COVID transmissions. Five places that are accountable for 80% of the COVID transmissions. Number one, restaurants. Two, bars and cafes. Three, places of worship. Four, hotels. And five, gyms. And let's go back to restaurants. Restaurants make up 40% of those transmissions. They make up 40% of the 80% of those transmissions. What's my point, people? As an ER physician, someone who's on the front line, someone who sees COVID patients. When I go to when I go to work tomorrow, I will see COVID patients. I can just tell you this. I know you want to go out to restaurants and eat, but COVID is as bad as they say it is. It's as bad as they say it is. I would just encourage you. We're almost there. We're almost there. We, we, we're the fourth quarter. We, 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 we're in the fourth quarter. You've made it this far. Keep going. And for those of you who, who got COVID, who contracted COVID and you're fine, congratulations. Those of us who've lost loved ones, uh, I, I'm sorry about your loss. Uh, but all of us who are still listening to this broadcast, this is a time we don't want to let up. And I get that you're tired, but this is not the time to um, let up. And just one more quick point about the point about uh, about the um, COVID virus. Just keep in mind, you're like, well, this is about heart disease. We're talk it's all about one in two black women have heart the disease. That's that's 50 percent of the people listen. 50 percent of the black women listen. This have heart disease. If you have heart disease and you get COVID, you have worse outcomes. People with heart disease have worse outcomes. Therefore, we got to go through this COVID thing. Now, as I was talking about preventing COVID, uh, just, uh, uh, another fact, and you're, and you're, and you're going to share. Put an eight in the chat if you're following me. Put an eight. All right. Do me a favor. Everyone take a deep breath. Because I'm moving. I'm moving. Take a deep breath. Relax the mind. Let's roll. So the other reason why masks are so important in order. So in order for you to contract COVID, you need to be exposed to one to one thousand active particles, one to one thousand COVID particles, one to one thousand. Put that here. Someone who has active COVID. Every time they breathe, they breathe out anywhere between 10,000 and 10 million active particles. How many do you need to be to contract COVID? One to 1,000. Someone who has active COVID, every time they breathe, they're breathing out between 10,000 and 10 million active particles. Hence, it's so important for you to wear your mask because it protects you from being exposed to those uh, particles. It protects you from being exposed to those particles. And socially distance protects you from being exposed to those particles as well. You with me? Almost done. Almost done. Now let's get to these vaccines just real quick. Let's get to these vaccines real quick. I'm, I'm, I'm going to move through this. I'm going to speak this in very broad categories. And by the way, if there's any no-vaxxers out, out there, uh, a no-vaxxer is they don't, they're not taking the vaccine no matter what. This talk's not for you. Please don't ask any questions because nothing's going to convince you. For the people who are vaccine hesitant, this talk is for you. Vaccine hesitance, you want to take it, but you're just not quite sure because you have some of my questions. This talk is for you. I'm, uh, this, will, this will be the most technical part of the talk. It won't be much. It'll be the most technical part. View the vaccines in two different categories. By the way, there's a 49 different trials going on for vaccines, but only two are, uh, are approved. Now, you've heard about this new technology. All right. View all the vaccines in two categories. The new technology, which is messenger RNA, and the old technology, which is the adenovirus. Um, we, we've used that technology. The messenger RNA is what Moderna used and Pfizer. And those are only two approved vaccines, messenger RNA. And people are hesitant because it's new. Real quick, define new. 
Keep in mind, this is SARS-CoV-2. SARS-CoV-2 is the name of the virus. We had SARS-CoV-1 back in 2003, 17 years ago. We've been studying this particular virus for 17 years, developing this technology. So it's not really new, okay? But back to this. So we have the messenger RNA, which is not new technology, but it was, it was, it's been studied for several years, and we use that to develop the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine. Then you have this other category, which nothing's approved yet, but the Johnson Johnson, that will be, we'll call them this category. It's old technology. We've used it before. Bam! That's all you need to know. That's all you need to know. Now, if you need to know more, um, I was going to say call me, but you can Google it because you can go into a whole lot of detail. You can get confused by it. But, you, but the point of me sharing is don't get confused. Now, real quick, we're going to walk through these vaccines about why people do not want to take them. The most common reason is, don't laugh. Uh, I got to set this up. I may have done 150 shows on, the, on, on, on all this. And at least and from all walks of life, all walks of life, all education levels. And a common question is they've heard that the vaccine has microchips in it or that it has fetal part fetal parts in it um, uh, or it has nanobites in it. And those are not, and those are, uh, and, and, and they're trying to microchip us. A few things. They didn't need to wait for COVID vaccine to develop. Uh, I mean, they didn't need to, to uh, develop a COVID vaccine in order to um, put in a microchipping. They didn't need that. They could have done it with the medicines that we take. They could have done it with the flu vaccine. So that's not true. And plus, we don't even have that technology. But I know where they where they came from, because people keep hearing about this, about these nano technology, nano, nano means small. It means that's all it means. So we, they, they use nanoparticles, real small particles, which we've been studying since 1954. So the nanoparticles, someone turned into nanobites. This is nanoparticles. It's a real small particle that they use to get the vaccine in you. That's one thing. Now, this is a good one. This is a good one. And this one makes sense. But if you follow me. You'll be a super user and you'll be able to explain this one. The ones like, hey, it can't be safe because it was, it develops, we developed it too fast. When I explain this in two minutes, you're going to be super users. You're going to know it better than anybody. You will be able to leave this talk that, that, that members of, of, of Alpha Kappa Alpha have sponsored for our community. And you'll be able to leave this talk, get on the phone, call your friends and say, look, let me explain this to you about this vaccine. Follow me. Deep breath again. So we're rolling. Deep breath. Relax for a second. I'll tell you. Relax. All right. We're getting ready to roll. Usually it takes 54 months, 54 to 72 months to develop a, a vaccine. 54 to 72 months. We did this one in about 10 to 12 months. Here's why. Follow me. Usually there's a preclinical phase. And then you have to do the clinical phase. Then there's the manufacturing phase. And then there's the distribution phase. And most of the time, it's been the manufacturing and, distri and distribution phase. It's done in one step, preclinical, clinical, manufacturing, and distribution. This time, it was all done at the same time. Why? Because of all the money that was put in. It was all done at the same time. And you heard me say that most of the time, it's put in the manufacturing and the distribution phase. That was being done at the same time. It took months, years off. And so for you scientists out there, you're going to say, well, wait a minute. What about the clinical phase? What about the, the preclinical trials? For clinical trials, the slow, the what 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 holds those up are usually you've got to get enough people to volunteer. But because of you and citizens across the world, they raised their hand in large numbers, and we had many volunteers. Therefore, we were able to move through the clinical trials. And unfortunately, yes, unfortunately, there was so much virus present in the communities that the participants in the experiments were able to go out and naturally be exposed and naturally contract the virus. So we had all the numbers that we needed. We had them in record time. No one was injected with like COVID. People naturally went out and got it. In other words, we were able, able to move to the clinical, I mean, the preclinical, the clinical, and the manufacturing and the distribution phase because of the number of people who, who, who had volunteered, the amount of money allowed us to move through everything fast. And that's why. Not one step was skipped. Not one. And then finally, and this is a big one. People don't want to take the vaccine because of side effects. 
They don't because of the side effects. In fairness to you, there's nobody on this earth, nobody in the world who can tell you the long term, long term being one year, two year, three year side effects of any of these vaccines. No one knows. No one can tell you. But what we do know is that most times side effects are seen in the first eight weeks. We started injecting people with these, back, with these vaccines back in March. So we at least have 10 months worth of data. We already know what, 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 what like some of the side effects are. So far, there's no long term as in the 10 months that we've been injecting. There, there are no side effects that we've discovered yet. Now, there's something called known side effects. It means that if you get the shot, or, or once you get it, you may develop fevers and chills. That's known. That's expected. You may develop a, 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 a body aches that's known and expected, and it goes away after 48 hours. I can tell you this, that you have a greater chance of dying from COVID right away, you just take about 13 days, than you do of dying from this vaccine. No one in the study has died from the vaccine. I know you've heard stuff on the internet. No, I've read the studies, read them long too. No one's died. And look at it this way, from a risk benefit point of view, if you get COVID, you may make it, you may not. If you get the vaccine, let's just say they figure out, well, there's something matter with it. You got a whole lot of time to help figure out what is the matter with it. And you got millions of other people as well. They have to figure out as well. I can tell you right now, with the new strains, with the new, with it being more contagious, 50% more contagious and 30% more deadly, it's so important for our community and the entire world to be vaccinated as soon as possible. And let me assure you this, I don't belong to any of these vaccination companies. In full disclosure, I've been fully vaccinated. I'm part of that 0.6% of people across that country. I've had both shots. My second shot was Three weeks ago, so I'm fully vaccinated. I got the Pfizer vaccine. Everyone in my family has gotten vaccinated except for my 14-year-old son. son. I know I move fast. I think uh, the love of ladies of Alpha Kappa Alpha will now open it up to my questions, but I thank you very much. Hello, um, Dr. Joffrey, I guess there's a transmission uh, issue here, but uh, thank you very much for that insightful presentation. Uh, the first question is around uh, individuals who have severe allergies to, um, to seasonal allergies or to other medications. And the question is, should individuals who have severe allergies take the uh, COVID vaccine? And if they do decide to do that, should they carry an EpiPen? That is a great question. Well, the first thing is you should talk to your primary care doctor. But the current recommendation of the of the FDA is that people with allergies should, should still get the shot. Now, once you get the shot, people with severe allergies, we kind of do it differently. Instead of just watching you for like 30 minutes, we watch you longer because often the, the the allergic reaction is going to come within that first hour. But you absolutely should take, uh, I mean, should carry your like, EpiPen. But one reason that, that the FDA recommends uh, people with severe allergies is because you have millions of people walking around this country who have severe allergies who have never had to use their EpiPen. And if you get an allergic reaction, it's going to happen right away anyway. Thank you. I think I there think, may be. Oh, good. No, I think uh, the SOAR is on mute. Okay. okay. Good evening again. This is SOAR Cheryl. And I'm reaching out uh, regarding a question related to heart disease. And that is that there's a myth that heart disease is only seen in the elderly. Can you uh, give us a comment on if heart disease is only seen in the elderly versus younger uh, people? 
people in the uh, population? Yeah, that, that is a great question. And this is an article that was published in 2019. Um, people under the age of 20 often experience heart disease, but definitely over the age of, definitely over the age of like 20, roughly one in two black women, um, and I'm sure that other races as well, but I was uniquely looking at black, one in two black women over the age of 20 have some form of heart disease. If you take genetics out of, of the picture, um, uh, um, it's often due at that young age to diet. High, 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 high fatty diets will cause increase, uh, will, will, will cause increased uh, incidences or increased likelihood of heart disease. So it is a myth that you have to be old to have heart. You have to be older to have heart disease. All right. So Dr. Joffrey, yes. uh, the next question is uh, also on heart disease. And often patients present to their doctors with some comorbidity, heart disease, lung disease, as you can appreciate. Can you um, please uh, provide insight on the interrelationship between the organ systems and why someone who has kidney disease say, um, why does heart disease and kidney disease, why are they coupled? Uh, because often uh, as, as a result of your elevated blood pressure, this is the most common reason, it causes kidney damage due to the atherosclerosis, which let's call that the clogging of your like vessels, um, which ends up causing kidney disease. Uh, so it's the atherosclerosis, the increased cholesterol, the increased fat that that that, that causes clogs in your like, arteries, which therefore impact the kidneys. Um, and, 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 and so it's, it's the heart disease that causes the kidney problems. Dr. Joffrey? Yes. We're going to move back to uh, COVID again, and this is related to the mutations of the virus. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you explain if the vaccine can maintain its integrity uh, based on these variants? That is a great question. Let me pull out my little model here just real quick. So in this model, view this model as being the whole COVID uh, virus. These are the spike proteins that we all heard about. Well, the vaccine was made for this entire thing. The vaccine was made for this entire part. Now, when there is a mutation, it only comes in one, it only, it comes in one part. Let's say in this little red part, the mutation came in this. Well, 99% of this virus is still the same. The vaccine was made for the whole thing. Hence, one mutation is not going to keep the vaccine from it working. Multiple mutations will cause a problem. Well, hence, that's why you hear Dr. Fauci and, and everyone pushing. Everyone get vaccinated right away because every time someone's infected is a, is, is a possibility that the vaccine can mutate. In answer to your question, Yes, the vaccine was made for this whole thing. One mutation uh, uh, means that 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 ninety nine percent of the virus is still covered, and that's and that is generally enough. Thank you. You're welcome. Our next question is also around COVID, and is the vaccine indicated for people who have some autoimmune disease or are otherwise Im uh, immunocompromised? That is a great question, which is why you hear the, hear the FDA saying, talk to your primary care doctor, because not all autoimmune diseases are, are equal. Uh, a, a non, not all immunocompromised people are equal. The danger is that you won't be able, if you're immunocompromised, the danger is that you, it's not danger, the, the concern is that you won't be able to, to mount an antibody response because you don't have enough immune reserve in you. But the general, but but in summary, you should talk to your primary care doctor um, or your or who's ever who's ever managing your immunocompromised state. Okay, another question around around COVID. 
Um, can you explain how it's possible to still get the virus after receiving the vaccine? There have been reports um, recently in the news about people who have actually been vaccinated, but they still get the uh, COVID. Yeah, this is very important. The, the, the two most common ways are, keep in mind, when you go and get your, uh, your, your vaccine, there's no test that is required. You could have already have you could already have COVID, but no symptoms yet. And, and so once you're vaccinated, you could still develop COVID. Now, this is the most important part, especially for, 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 for people who are recently vaccinated and who are going to get. Once you get vaccinated, you have no immunity that day. You have no immunity the next couple of days. So you're just as you it's almost like you weren't vaccinated. It takes at least two weeks, at least two weeks for you to develop any immunity at all. And after those two weeks, you're only about 50 to 60% immune. So just keep that in mind that once you get vaccinated and, and that's what's going on, people get vaccinated and they think that they're good. No, you're, you're no more covered than if you weren't vaccinated early on. It takes at least two weeks for you to develop any immunity at all. Thank you. Uh, we again have a question uh, regarding COVID and the impact of age. Can you please uh, shed some light on whether younger individuals uh, should take the vaccine and, and in what way does age impact um, the presentation of disease? That, that is a great question. L looking at, let me, let me deal with the, with the, the age bit part. No matter what age you are, the older you are, the more likely you are to have a negative outcome from, from, from my COVID or to have serious disease. Doesn't necessarily need to be a negative, mean that you may, you, the more likely you are needing to be hospitalized, the older you are. So a person who's 20, a person who's, who's 40 has more risk than a 30 year old. And obviously somebody who's 60 has more risk than a 30 year old. Year old. So there's definitely a linear relationship between age. Now let's talk to you young folks for a minute. Um, in the media, and it's true, uh, with the old strain, younger people were not dying from, from my COVID. But what they but but what we did not highlight enough was was that um, younger people they were being hospitalized. And when you're over the 18 you're hospitalized, no one's around you. You're not allowed to have parents with you. So you can be 18 years old if you're placed on a ventilator. No one's around you. It's your parents are not allowed to sit there and hold your hands. You're by yourself. So you so you can get sick and it's very likely you will come off of the ventilator. The other part to this is there's something called long COVID or long haulers. And those are uh, those are patients who they got COVID. They're they have cleared themselves of active COVID, meaning they cannot spread it to anyone else but they still have symptoms. What we're starting to let's see that even young people, even young people are developing into long haulers, which means that there are several people, young folks, they were marathon runners prior to um, developing COVID. And now they can't even walk to the bathroom door. Hopefully this will slowly go away, but long haulers is becoming extremely common. In fact, they are even saying that about 70% of the reports so far, that 70% that of people are experiencing long haul symptoms, meaning that they still have symptoms. And 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 if you don't mind, uh, uh, can I just comment about, make a comment about the older people as well, especially those of us who have older um, parents. One symptom that they don't talk about is confusion. Sudden confusion can be a sign for COVID in older people. Sudden confusion can be a sign for COVID in other people, which is different from, from my brain, Paul. We can talk about that shortly. But so if you saw your mom and dad who are over the age of 60, you saw them last night and you go to the next morning till I see them and they're confused. It, it could very likely be COVID. Now, prior to like COVID, just to tell you, within the ER, you if a suddenly confused older older person comes in, you're obviously concerned about a stroke. But the first thing that we check is is your urine. 
Urinary tract infections causes sudden confusion in older people. But what we're finding that about 26%, the 20% or 26% of older people who have COVID, they present with sudden confusion. What is my point? My point is, is that if you, if, if someone older than you have to suddenly confuse, that's definitely a sign that they need to go to the hospital right away. But more importantly, it's definitely a sign that while you're taking them to the hospital, while you're calling 911, it's very important for you to wear a mask. And I don't mean to talk so much. Let's go back to these younger people uh, because they brought it up. Uh, uh, and, and some of the symptoms, while the younger people are not dying at the same rates as, as older people, there's something called brain fog. Brain fog is you just feel like you just feel like you can't gather your, your like, like thoughts as fast. Things just seem kind of cloudy. Younger people are experiencing bra brain fog even after they clear themselves of the COVID. Hey, Dr. Joffrey, we're still on COVID. Uh, another question about uh, reports in the news regarding which vaccines actually stop transmission or boost the um, transmission rate versus a vaccine that actually decreases death from COVID symptoms. Can you speak to that, please? Would, would you ask me that again? I, I missed it. Would you, would you ask me that again, please? Which vaccines actually stop transmission of COVID versus those that actually decrease the death of COVID symptoms? I got it now. All of the vaccines decrease deaths. So, so of the scientific papers that have been presented, which are from Pfizer, BioNTech, as well as Moderna. Um, don't forget, Johnson & Johnson has not been approved. They have filed for their emergency uses, but they've only given us a press release. We've not seen the actual data. But as relates to Johnson & Johnson, I mean, to the Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna, of everyone who received the medication, no one died. No one died. Now, to your latter question, what about transmission? Have you noticed that for the Pfizer and Moderna, they still ask you to wear a, a mask? And here's why. They simply did not study that part during the study, meaning that they didn't study once you have contracted COVID, I mean, once you uh, have been vaccinated and you come in contact with that COVID, can you spread it to someone else? The general feeling is no, but until it's proven, they're still recommend, recommending people to wear a mask. Thank you. Uh, we have a wealth of COVID questions as one might expect. Um, our next question is around uh, COVID, uh, the COVID vaccine and flu shots. Um, if one gets the COVID vaccine, does that uh, obviate the need for a flu shot? And the add on second question that they ask is the impact of um, can animals spread uh, COVID-19? Uh, that's a great question. Let me deal with the, the former. The flu vaccine and the COVID vaccine are two different vaccines. There's no cross. There, there, there is no crossing. If you get the COVID vaccine, it does not protect you from the flu in any type of way. If you get the flu vaccine, it is not protection against COVID in any type of way. The recommendation is, is that you get both. The recommendation is, is that you get both. Um, as relates to animals, yes, it has been proven that, uh, that humans can infect um, animals uh, or, or that dogs, uh, humans can infect animals. We're just not sure if the animals can transfer to a human. We're not sure if the animals can transfer to a human. Now, you may have heard that in Denmark, they killed uh, 2 million minks. Yes, mink the animal. Why? Because what would happen was many of them contracted COVID. And that's a big thing within science because it, 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 was, a zoo, it was a zoonotic transmission, meaning it passed from one species to another. When that happens from a human to an animal and you, and you are sure about it, then that, that's, a, uh, that's a very scary thing because then you don't know what kind of virus you have. So what Denmark did, they chose to kill 2 million minks, uh, close down 250 mink farms, 
and the United Kingdom uh, and a few a, a few other countries would not even allow flights from Denmark for like several month, months. What's my point? Uh, yes, it is possible to transmit to animals. Okay, this is also related to COVID and it's about the reinfection rate. Um, if you could speak about the reinfection rate um, when people who actually do contract the virus a second time and if it's more severe or um, they have other um, issues. And part of that question, second part of that question is also related to the need to continue uh, masking and social distancing, which I think you've already addressed. But um, the reinfection rate is something that is out there that people would like to know. What is the likelihood of reinfection and then what are the adverse events associated with the reinfection? That's a very good question. Reinfection rates are actually quite low. And if you get reinfected because your body already has antibodies, your symptoms are not usually as bad. I get it. You've heard one or two media stories about one or two cases and the media blows up those one or two cases. There's been 25 million people across the world. It's been one or two cases that they were reinfected and got sicker. But the other cases of the rare event of being reinfected, you're less likely to, to have um, a, a, a bad symptoms. Why? Because you already have antibodies. Now, as it relates to the mass, I just want to pivot uh, because I did, I did address the mass. I mean, the mass. But don't forget, I talked about that there are new strains out. And laser of Alpha Kappa Alpha, uh, I, know, I know this is supposed to be about the heart, but, uh, but while we're educating our Community, let me just make sure they're, they're able to go out and educate folks. You've heard, of, you've heard a lot about the variants. There's a bunch of different variants. Real quick, lean in because you need to understand this just real quick. Viruses mutate all the time. While you've heard about variants, you will hear about several more. That's what viruses do. So it's nothing uncommon. Why do we get a flu shot every year? Because the flu virus has mutated. Right now, there are four known strains and you're sure you're going to hear about more. And there's the Cal 20C, which is in California. There is the B17, B117 from the United Kingdom. There is a B135 from South Africa, which you've heard about. And that's a big one. And there's, there's a P1 from Brazil. What you need to know about this is someone wants to ask that question. How do I know which one I have? Or if you if you will do get COVID. Well, here's the deal. Your doctor, uh, Dr. Fauci, no one can look at you and tell you which one you 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 have. You've got to go through a special lab and they've got to do some genetic testing. But what all those mu mutations mean and what it shows us is that they are 55 percent more contagious, 55 percent more contagious. And unlike we said two weeks ago, we're finding them to be more deadly, too. They are about 30% more deadly. What does that mean to, to, to like me and you? If you've been wearing a mask and you wear those little cheap little masks, as Dr. Fauci said, you need to double up and wear two masks. And you need to increase your like social distancing. Here's why. We, all, we, we were already told about the six feet, right? We were already told about that. Well, when I cough, the virus goes six feet. When I sneeze, the virus goes 20 feet. I'm sorry, when I cough, the virus goes 20 feet. When I sneeze, the virus goes 30 feet. Hence, wearing that mask protects that virus from being, I mean, it keeps that virus from being e e ejected. And in case someone sneezes around you, that mask protects you. And the final thing is to increase it from six feet distance that, that we recommend, increase it to about 12 feet. If you can keep a 12 feet distance, because if it's 50% more contagious, as Dr. Fauci said, we got to increase our mitigation game. We've got to increase our protecting ourselves game. Increase how far you stay away from my people up to, up to, up to 12 feet um, and then double your mask as well. Dr. Joffrey, the next question um, is around the use of the vaccine in pregnant women, the impact on the fetus, and could you also speak to men who are 
impregnating women? What should men continue to uh, have the COVID vaccine as well? Um, yes. So while the study, uh, while both studies, the Pfizer and the Moderna study, uh, they excluded pregnant women. However, uh, 16 of the participants in the Pfizer study and 24% of the, I mean, 24 people in the Moderna study became pregnant. Um, there were no negative outcomes. And the current recommendation that, that the FDA changed it, which is uh, they're recommending pregnant women talk to their primary care doctor, talk to their OBGYN. And if after that discussion, if they want to get vaccinated, it, 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 it is recommended. But it has to be a conversation with your primary care doctor or with your OBGYN. As it relates to men and the vaccine, I have not read any data about that. None, none at all. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, it looks like we're going back to the heart now. And we have a question about heart palpitations. And what are heart beats? Um, should that be something someone should be concerned about regarding heart disease? Is that one of the early signs of a heart attack? Can you please address that? I actually missed the first part of that question. There was some background noise. What was the first part of the question? Palpitations? About heart palpitations or fluttering of the heart. It, it's some concerns about if that is our early signs of heart disease and, you know, should they be concerned about um, having... Um, uh, having a heart attack at that time. Well, the question, uh, uh, they, uh, it depends on the context. If you are a 20 year old who's healthy and you are experiencing palpi palpitations, you still need to go get it checked out because keep in mind that heart attack is not the, the only thing. There's a there's, there's a hundred other things that it could be from normal to a heart attack. There's a lot of, there are a lot of other things that it could be in the uh, middle, you could your heart your heart could be in a in a fast rhythm such as SBT. That's a that's a rhythm where normally your heart beats like this. If you're an SBT, your heart is beating like that, which is which is too fast. And so there are medications that they've got to give you to help slow to help slow that down. And uh, some some common is some common drinks causes complications as well. Too much coffee. Um, for some people, just a regular cup of coffee. Energy drinks or anything with a lot of caffeine can cause palpitations. But usually, that's not one of the main symptoms for a heart attack. However, if you're older and say you're, you're much older and you never had palp palpitations ever, and all of a sudden you're experiencing palpitations, that should mean more to you because you've never had them. And, and, and I would encourage you then that you should follow up with your primary care, care doctor. And when in doubt, call 911. When in doubt, call 911. Okay. And as a segue into um, that question, I wanted to find out what is a, a good way to calm yourself down? Can you give us some tips or some points on if you are experiencing some of these symptoms, how you would calm yourself down? Um, especially, you know, people who uh, tend to be anxious. Yes, um, I'm. I'm smiling because I'm. I'm thinking that within. The, 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 all right, look, you all know I'm not a self-plugging person, but yes, I go over calm, slowing your heart rate in my bestseller, Train Your Mind for Split Second Decisions. It's. It, it talks about how you slow your heart rate down, and one thing is called the Valsalva maneuver, which means is you take a deep breath and you push down like you're having a bowel movement, but you don't have one. You push down and that, if, if, if that heart rhythm, if that increased heart rate is, is, is due to something that's benign, that can help slow it down as well. In fact, when you come to the ER and you're in a really fast heart rate, while I'm putting in the IVs and while the nurses are getting the like, medications, I will have you try that. And believe it or not, about 50% of the time, it works. I don't have to give the person the like, medication. I don't have to admit them to the hospital. Uh, but it's called the Valsalva, V-A-L-S-A-L-V maneuver. You can, you, can, you, you, you can like Google it. But again, 
Context is everything. If you're healthy and you don't have any, any medical problems, give it a shot. If you have more of you high blood pressure, coronary artery disease, especially diabetes. Now, real quick, for anyone with diabetes, especially the older you get, you may very well have no signs. You may not have any chest pain. You may not have any palpitations. Why? Because the diabetic, um, their pain system uh, is different the older they get with diabetes. That's why when you come, to, if you're older and you come in for diabetes, when that's fainting, you just feel funny, you feel drowsy, we often check your heart because they present differently. The take home point is people who are diabetic and people who are older, anything that seems odd, especially in this area, especially involving fainting, you should make sure you follow up with your primary care doctor, dial 911 or call your doctor. Dr. Joffrey, um, we, in our last three minutes, uh, we do have a question um, again in heart disease. Uh, the question is around at what age uh, would a stress test or an EKG be recommended for an individual? That's a great question. You can EKG at any time you want. Um, and I would recommend uh, everyone on this call, no matter how, how old you are uh, at your next primary care doctor appointment, get an uh, EKG. But let me let's be very clear about what an EKG is, because sometimes I'll get a patient. Hey, they come in and say, Doc, uh, I'm, I'm having chest pain. But my EKG three, four days ago or even three years ago, it was normal. And EKG only tells you what's going on with your heart at that second. Doesn't tell you what, what was happening 20 years ago, 10 days ago, nothing. It tells you what's going on at that second. Now, it tells you something about a few minutes ago if it's abnormal and if you had a heart attack. It tells you that. But a normal EKG does not necessarily mean that you have a normal heart. It just means at that time, right now, your, your EKG is fine. As relates to a stress test, stress tests are something that, you, that they often do if you're having some kind of symptoms. Uh, maybe you're more short of breath. Maybe you have some chest pain. Maybe you have some arm um, tingling. A stress test, uh, they put you on a treadmill and they put electrodes in you and they have you walk. That is a stress test. But you all need to be very clear. A stress test is nothing but a, it's an indication. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a leaning towards, if it's normal, it's a leaning towards this person probably doesn't have cardiac disease. Doesn't mean that, it does not mean that you do, does not mean that you do not. That was confusing. I'm just simply trying to I say it's just a data point. The test that tells you everything is that if you want to know whether that you got any type of heart disease or not, it's called a cardiac catheterization. Is when they tickle, they put a little uh, camera up inside your leg and they go in, they actually look at your coronary arteries. If that is normal, then you clearly don't have heart disease. A stress test gives you an indication. You can say, I don't think that they do. Does that help? Was that confusing? That was I think that that was, yes. Oh, good, good. Okay, good. Okay. Um, one other question uh, back to the uh, COVID vaccine is, um, can you think about what the material differences are between the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine? Um, I know that one, you know, the second shot is after 21 days uh, and the other one is the second shot is after 28 days. But can you see what the material differences are between those two vaccines? When they say the material difference, can you ask them a comment? Do they mean like the the medicines are 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 are, are the chemicals that are that are that are in them? I, I I'm suspecting that that's probably what they mean as far as the active ingredient. For the vaccines, um, that is that is a very good question, and I am not being rude, but I, I I will I will tell you this: I've looked at both ingredients, and I'm about to read one of them to you, and 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 I can just say this: for most of those ingredients, uh, here's one. So let me just share this with you. Um, uh, I actually, actually, I don't have it. Let me just say that that for most of the ingredients, there are names that even as a physician. I don't understand. 
Um, so it's it, 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 I, and to, to be to be honest with you, me and my colleagues sat and tried. We couldn't even pronounce them. Um, so from our vantage point, it, there there was no major difference from that level. From a clinical point of, of, of view, as you so wisely point out, one of them's twenty one days, one of them's twenty eight days. Um, but even from the medical world, because I'm not a virologist, that's to the extent. And mind you, this is someone who's read both papers a couple times. Thank you. Dr. Joffrey, thank you very much for that spirited engagement. And uh, we appreciate that insight. And now we'd like to turn the mic over to our Sora Crystal for closing remarks. Thank you. So, Crystal, you're on my mic. You agree? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Testing. Yes, Can you hear me? Greetings. I am Crystal Williams, your event chair, and on behalf of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, Xi Zeta Omega Chapter here in Washington, D.C. We would like to thank each of you for your attendance of our Pink Those Red Community Impact Day event under our Target 2 Health and Wellness Program platform. This event was proudly supported by the Ivy Foundation. And we are so pleased that Dr. Godfrey Mont Vonner, our fraternal brother, was able to host this session and answer your questions for us today. And we hope that our efforts to reach the community regarding the impact of COVID-19 and heart disease has been beneficial. A recording of this event will be posted on our page for your on-demand viewing. Please continue to visit us and learn more about our upcoming events on our chapter website at www.akaxpo.com and via social media on Instagram and Twitter at Xi Zeta Omega AKA and of course our Facebook, which is www.facebook.com forward slash Xi Zeta Omega 1908. Thank you and have a happy Heart Health Month.